Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me. I'd like to I thank the organizers for allowing me this opportunity to speak with all of you. Uh, this is one of my uh, interesting projects that I love and the patients I deal with are wonderful. And I thank them for being so courageous and, and being part of our studies and uh, very grateful for this. So I'm gonna talk about the updates on this sort of journey of testing treatment for ocular hemangioblastomas, as we call them, or retinal angiomas associated with VHL. I have no financial disclosures. So as you know, when hemangioblastoma is one of the most common manifestations of VHL itself. Usually it arises in a very small, typically asymptomatic lesion. These are bigger lesions you're seeing here. Uh, they can, can be hard to detect, but your vision can be perfectly fine. These are highly vascular tumors that, that you know, acquires these dilated vessels. You can see my pointer. Actually, you can see my pointer. But the vessels are all dilated, and you can see the tumors uh, up above here, and also some whitish material that's the hard exudate. And eventually, it can cause vision loss from this exudation. The, the blood vessels are not normal. They leak, and they cause some scarring. So here's a, a higher view of this, showing the vascular tortuosity and the dilation. And those peripheral tumors you're seeing are the peripheral uh, retinal hemangioblastomas, uh, which are, again, this patient is completely asymptomatic. However, when it gets a little larger and the blood vessels uh, don't work quite as well, they start to leak. And you can see this yellow material coming out of the and is causing uh, some elevation in your retina. And this is called hard exudates, or these are really fatty deposits that, that occur. And you may have a tumor out in the far out in the, in the center part of the eye, but the, the, the part that you can see here, the optic nerve, that's the nerve that that connects the eyeball to the brain. And this is the center part of the eye, the macula. And some of that's not touch, you're, you have good vision, but these hard exudates can actually flow into the area. Even though it's far, far away, you can still have vision loss. And again, one of the signs of really active disease is this vascular tortuosity. And the blood vessel is quite dilated. It should be normal like this kind of vessel here. But you see this, is, the diameter is quite dilated and it's quite corkscrew like quite tortuous. So this is the first sign that we have the tumor there. And as I mentioned, um, this is a tumor with tortuous vessels, and again, the hard exudate. Now, this one is right in the center of the eye. The patient now has vision loss. And I mean, you often can get a, a, a dye test, it's called fluorescein angiogram, which is injected into the arm, and it flows right into the, into the body and then right to the eyes, and we take photographs of it, and that shows the area of that's, that's affected. Another test we have is called ocular, to, uh, um, uh, ocular coherence tomography, uh, which seen here in normal OCT on and the diagram named A is the normal uh, normal length of sort of the width of your, your retina, what we see. But here with von Hippel's, you see this patient has evidence of this lipid in the eye. And again, this is markedly elevated. It should be nice and thin. It's right through this area. This area right there should be very thin, but it's filled with fluid and the vision is quite compromised because of that. So some of the treatments we have is really to reduce the, the, the tumor itself. And this one here, there's a, there's a, there's a, a hemangioblastoma right here, a very small one. After laser, you can see that it's, it's actually been totally ablated and it's gone, it's absolutely flat. And that's what we wanna see. We wanna see destruction of those tumors. And the patient's not gonna notice much change. Uh, this, in this area is way in the par periphery. There's no field loss and the patient should be fine. Here's a patient with more extensive disease. You can see that there are laser burns uh, seen here as well as here. Uh, there's still some activity going on up here. As you can see, there's this corkscrew vessel is still up here uh, and there's some activity that needs to be treated. So this patient is in the middle of treatment and will need more treatment. Sometimes the tumors are big and too far away. And, and this one here is a huge tumor, which will be very hard to laser. So our next, our next uh, treatment is actually using cryotherapy, which is a free saw, uh, area of looking at this tumor. Again, the, the hard exudate is here. And with time, uh, this is now after the treatment. And as you can see, uh, there's an acute whitening of the, of the retina. This is the destruction of the tumor. And you can see there's a scar. And now the hard exudate is much less. This is months after post-treatment. The ones we have most difficult with are the optic nerve retinal hemangioblastomas. This is a very hard one to see, but you can see here that this little red area here and this opacity. So this is a tumor uh, sitting on the optic nerve. If we were to laser that, we would cause a lot of damage. You would actually still feel loss. Patients may not see either above or below, or centrally, they may lose vision. So laser is not an, an answer for these tumors. 
And you can see here, there's a patient who's uh, 2003, 2004, and 2005. You can see there's slight growth. Uh, and these get into trouble when you have, um, when you cause the macro to, to, to be uh, affected. So in this case, here's a large tumor. And in the center of the eye, this has been pulled over because new blood vessels also have scarring tissue and they go along with this. This is the patient I showed you earlier. There's a lot of scar tissue and this patient has markedly decreased vision. This patient would look terrible with lots of, lots of laser and lots of um, cryotherapy, but the patient is still pretty good because the center is not involved. This patient has moderate vision loss because these tumors are still fairly active. So in our experience at, at the National Eye Institute, where I've seen a number of patients with non helpful Lindell's disease, this was, was written up a number of years ago, 15 years ago, we're ready to redo the, the, the actual count. We have a larger number of patients seen. But at this point in, in 2007, we had 670 eyes uh, who were in 355 patients who were seen. And you can see that about 70% of them actually had uh, ocular lesion. In other words, they actually have an eye lesion. And the tysis or nucleation, tysis means that the eye has shrunken up. Nucleation means a removal. And just the papillary means that it's right in the optic nerve. So approximately 21% of those eyes actually have some, uh, some poor vision. And we know that von Hippel-Lindau's linkage to a tumor suppressor gene in chromosome 3, um, P25. And, and this is expresses in, in, in the heterozygote for the VHL protein. And, and I, this has been discussed earlier already by others. And in the ophthalmology department at, at the in National Institute, we were very curious as to looking at the genetic um, the gene in the tumor itself, but that had never been done. So in 1999, which is a long time ago, more than 20 years ago, we did a micro dissection. In other words, taking a very small piece of the tumor, which was on, which had been removed, and this was in our autopsy. Uh, uh, library in which we were able to remove this and the micro dissection, we can actually look at the tumor tissue itself. We found that it also has this loss of heterozygosity. The tumor you can see uh, with T and, and the normal, you can see there's depot bands, but in the T and the tumor, we actually lose the heterozygosity. So we know where that where that tumor is actually happening. And also it expresses vascular endothelial growth factor, which promotes a lot of blood vessel growth, and we can see that it actually stains in, in the cell that calls stromal cells. Here's a patient who has new blood vessels. It's not exactly a, a von Hippel-Lindell uh, VHL type of um, imagined blastoma, but it has these new vessels growing on the optic nerve. And this has caused a lot of scarring and a lot of tugging of the center part of the eye, in which case this patient actually had that white tissue removed. And when we looked at this, we can see that vascular theater growth factor of VEGF in here as well. So we know the VHL protein regulates hypoxia-induced genes, and if there's a VHL binds to this inducible uh, uh, hypoxia-inducible factor and, and marks it for breakdown, when the VHL protein is missing, uh, we get a buildup of these abnormal um, uh, uh, factors such as VEGF, that's the growth factor, but it's only VEGF. There's a whole host of them. So all these are affected, and this I have, to, I have to think about as we... Uh, talked through my, my little journey here and our treatment. We were also uh, very struck by the, what, what was the actual the, the tumor cells that we're looking at. And it turned out to be those stromal cells that look like foamy cells that are actually the loss of, of, the, of the VHL function. And indeed, those are the areas that we're concerned about that, that causes the, the VHL to, to grow. So our first study was done uh, on a, a drug which is no longer available. It's a, a pigulated um, aptamer called macogen. It's an, oli it's an oleo um, oligonucleotide, which binds to VEGF-165. And our study was to look at three milligrams six times for six months. And this treatment is injected in the eye. You see by the schematic there, with a very fine needle, it's injected in the eye. We, we tried it in a very small number of patients. Five patients were treated. We did this every six every six weeks for six injections, and that's 30 weeks. What we want to look at was a change in visual acuity, uh, best cut to visual acuity by one year after initiating therapy. We're also looking at the macro thickness, what I showed you on the optical coherence tomography, whether that would reduce down to be smaller, and also the fluorescein leakage, what I showed you in terms of the, the black and white photos. So this is the OCT, it's a little bit different. This is an older version of it, and this is colorized. You can see that the, the OCT does not go back to normal. It went from 600 microns to 400 microns. So again, this had some effect, but it wasn't sufficient to reduce it to get better vision. 
And the tumor itself was unchanged. We sort of expected that because NEGF is only one, one aspect that we're looking at. But what's interesting is those hard exudates actually got, got smaller and they disappear. So it did reduce the, the leakage of the blood vessels, but it wasn't enough to make an, a dent to reduce the tumors. And here you see uh, that this is making less and less a hard exudate and, and, and helped to clear the vision a little bit more. Uh, however, we've had patients who all also could go on to increase uh, heart exudate, unfortunately. So the therapy um, really was, was, was limited uh, because uh, these, these are small lesions. I'm just gonna go back here for a second. I think we missed some slides here. Sorry, uh, let me just go back to the slides here. Okay, here, we, yeah, no, here we go. Sorry about that. I'm just gonna go back to sharing. Okay, so so the one other one other drug that that we we tested after the um, a macogen was Lucentis or Venabizumab. Venabizumab is also the same as Avastin, which is used for tumors. Uh, it is similar to our anti-VEGF therapy. And we did, again, five case series and seven monthly in injections. And again, this is a visit eight weeks after the final injection. This is a humanized monoclonal uh, fragment that binds to all VEGF isoforms. And here, this is a patient that we saw with a large tumor. You can see that the patient really didn't have much change. This is a, a baseline. It actually got more fluid and more leakage. And you can see the op optical coherence tomography shows that this was quite elevated. Another patient similarly uh, had changes uh, that, were, that were really did not improve either. And so this really was not a very good treatment at this point. And this is a, this is a, a third patient showing uh, the vessels were really small on here because they were rather small. We thought they may be a, a, a very a very small uh, treatment effect, but it came back as soon as we stopped it. And the co optical coherence tomography didn't show any change because the macular wasn't wasn't affected. And that patient actually had pretty good vision. So the smaller lesions seemed to have some effect. But the, the, this one large lesion actually became worse, and it was, um, uh, it was unfortunate, and this patient eventually lost the eye. Another study we did was looking at sunitinib and to see whether we could uh, improve that. And here's the patient. We, we had troubles recruiting from that. We actually had um, only uh, two patients, and this patient completed the study. And you, you can see that this, this really, the hard exudates and the fluid actually resolved, but the optic nerve tumor remained the same. There was absolutely no change in, in, the, tumor, in the tumor. This is a write, writing for Dr. Dr. Kalin talking about the HIF. As we know, the, the HIF inhibitor is a really important aspect of this because as we talked about, all those different um, aspects of, of the factors that are important for causing these tumors were not, not really controlled by our anti-VEGF therapy. But in, so in the absence of the functional VHF protein, we get this aberrant um, serialization, accumulation of the HIF2 alpha and, and dimerization of HIF1 B. Uh, beta. And subsequently, all those elements we talked about would drive the tumor growth. And, and many of you know now that the Sudafan MK6482 from Merck is a potent selective small molecule, a HIF2 alpha inhibitor, which blocks the heterodimization of the HIF1B uh, alpha. And we were very fortunate to be part of the study uh, that really resulted in the approval of the study uh, of this drug for patients with um, kidney cancer, as well as uh, a CNS or brain uh, tumors. So diagnosis of BHL disease is based on germline mutation. And this was primarily a renal cell carcinoma study looking at tumors that were three centimeters or greater that would require immediate uh, surgical intervention. And, and this is 61 patients were, were given 160 milligrams orally once a day. Uh, and the objective primary outcome was looking at the tumors in, in, the, um, in the kidney. Uh, we took that opportunity to look at the eyes and we looked at visual acuity. We measured visual acuity. We had a dilated fundus exam, show, as much as what I've showed you with the color images of all participants at baseline repeated every 12 weeks. And, and then if they have active lesions that we would uh, actually follow them very closely. Uh, and we really were, uh, were 
mass to a num number of things because we didn't see the patients in other clinics. So they were all sent to the reading center uh, and in the dark reading center where they were graded and baseline and follow-up images were seen of all the retinal um, images. So what we saw here was that there were 29 eyes that were uh, eligible and the of 16 participants who actually had um, BHL uh, ocular involvement. And the medium time to res response was great as improved was 11.9 weeks. Remember, we didn't see patients very frequently. Uh, and I've seen patients now who, have been, who are now uh, not on protocol and it couldn't actually improve as, as early as one week. So it's quite remarkable. But what's interesting about this is 100% of all participants in the study improved with their ocular lesions. So the eye lesions actually had an improvement. Let me show you some examples of this. This is a baseline. Patient has this tumor you can see with dilated vessel. The tumor is, in, is in the outline here. With time, the, the vascularity would decrease. So you like to see it being white, whiter, and this also become whiter. What's also interesting is these vessels that are dilated are much less dilated. So this is a real success in terms of the tumor regression. Here's one that's really a small one. You can see uh, growing between the two feeders and the feeding and the dilating, as well as the, 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 the returning vessel. And they're both dilated. Oops, I'm gonna go back to it again. Wrong way, pardon me. And you see that here that this tumor and now has gotten a whitish color, just still some uh, vascularity to it. And the vessels are at much less, but you still see some tortuosity here. And as with time, you can see that this has really gotten flattened out and there's still less uh, vessel dilation. These are the ones that we have absolutely no treatment for. This is a patient who came in and was on baseline, was treated, but had to be stopped because she had had a vitrectomy for a retinal problem that was not related to BHL. So this is in the six weeks when she was still off the drug. But by week 49, you can see that her tumor has really gone down to just a white, whitest tissue, much smaller than this large tumor over here. Uh, the vessels have, uh, have really um, calmed down. They're not dilated anymore. And there's not uh, the hemorrhages. These are hemorrhages on top of the tumor, which is just very tiny bit here. So this patient really had a huge success. And these are tumors that we've never had any good treatment for in the past. Uh, this is the other treatment, uh, other person who's had optic nerve tumor. This is at baseline and, and week 49, you really see nothing there. Um, this is really just a scar tissue. So this really looks really excellent. We don't know how to treat these patients yet. Do they have to be on treatment for a long time? Uh, can we do anything else in between? Those are questions we still have to answer. And this is again, a small optic nerve tumor right in this area uh, by 13 weeks. And by 49 weeks, you really can barely see anything there at all. So Belsudafan is now an FDA approved um, in participants with BHL associate renal cell carcinoma, the CNS lesions have, have, uh, are also an indication as well. It has a very favorable safety profile. It promises to be a wonderful uh, you know, a drug for ocular BHL disease because of the BC. Every patient we've, we saw actually had a response to this. It was a redu reduction in the size of the tumor, which we've never gotten before. Vascularity gotten better. And we can see that when we laser patients and exudation in a subset of, uh, of, of patients actually reduced as well. There was no progression in any of the eye assessed by independent review of images by the reading center or by any of the clinicians. There's no new uh, retinal uh, hemangioblastoma reported in any eye. The benefits observed across the spectrum of lesion and location, so both the optic nerve and the peripheral lesions uh, were, were treated. Peripheral lesions that may be large, if you treat them, you can add the laser and, and perhaps not have to do any drug after that at all. So reduction in size and vascularity and, and the four juxtapapillary uh, uh, hemangioblastoma was absolutely wonderful. Uh, you can, we've never seen that sort of regression before. So they said typically there's a rapid um, response within 12 weeks and it's sustained over at least follow-up of six months in this case. So Beltasudafan is not FDA approved for ocular BHL lesions and alone, although other systemic diseases qualify the patient to, have, to actually have the, have the drug, uh, ocular BHL lesions should be an indication for treatment with oral uh, Beltasudafan. Much is to be learned regarding how to administer as I discussed earlier in the future of these ocular lesions. Large lesions should start with oral therapy and maybe eventually have a blade of therapy such as laser or cryotherapy. 
The optic nerve hemangioblastomas and, and, and the juxtapolarins need more data to understand the length of, of therapy. I think I'm highly optimistic. I think we've had a real game changer here in terms of uh, treating patients with, with von Hippel-Lindau's disease in the eye, and we're hope, hopefully can be able to play a major part in helping uh, patients acknowledge, get this. I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers and colleagues who contributed a great tool to this, our group and the, and, and the National Eye Institute Division of Epidemiology and Clinical Applications. Dr. Henry Wiley did a number of the, of the uh, treatments as well as um, being a, was, was a principal investigator in, in a number of other studies, Dr. Marcin Linehan and Dr. Shinavasan and Lisa Mark has been remarkably wonderful in helping us uh, like have the patients uh, that we need to, to study. Uh, Dr. Wong was one of our investigators. Uh, and of course, our NDNDS and NICHD colleagues were absolutely uh, amazing in helping us. And a special thanks to our courageous patients and their families for trusting us to, to do some of the research, which I think has helped many patients. And we hope that we'll continue to do more research to really um, get to getting a very good vision for all patients with VHL. With that, I can take some questions and I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for your wonderful talk. Dr. Jesse Pasternak was called to the OR, so I'm taking um, over. Are there any questions from the audience? Dr. Chu, I'm not seeing any questions. This um, is, oh, this there is, you go. Yeah, this go is Marston Lenahan. <clears throat> Emily, beautiful talk, obviously, and it's been such a wonderful opportunity for us to work with you over these years with these patients and all the clinical trials you've done and the unbelievable expertise given hope to our patients. I, I just can't tell you what it means to work with someone like you. Uh, and, and boy, what a beautiful talk. Let me ask you a question. Do you, uh, two questions. One, if you could, if we could, and let's just say hypothetically, there were not an issue with children. Now that's a whole different thing. Yes. And prevention is not approved for you, yeah, all that business. If there were no issues there, when would you start therapy? I mean, what, you know, maybe in the future, when would you start therapy? You know, children can get these, number one. Number two, um, what do you think about the potential? Maybe not. What do you think about the potential for things like diabetic retinopathy and stuff? Would it have any role there, do you think, of those kind of things? Well, let's start with the, 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 the age in children. I think I, I would love to have it for children because they're the right. ones who have the optic nerve tumor. They, they have a right. lifetime burden of, vi of vision right. loss. And you know, visual impairment is such a quality of life issue for patients. It's very difficult. So I would start as young as I could if they have things that are indicated and they need it. You know, we could do lasers and things for the smaller lesions if they don't, they don't need it. We definitely can do our, our traditional treatment. But I think the Sudafan is going to change that dramatically. So in terms of other eye diseases, you know, we've, we're very interested in seeing whether we could formulate it and put it into a uh, platform where you can actually uh, secrete it within the eye itself and have it slow release from the eye. Uh, that would be really uh, amazing because there are some patients who don't have systemic disease. And there are also patients with what we call uh, sporadic, uh, on hip uh, not, uh, not on hip but sporadic uh, hemangiomas that have no VHL, you do mosaicism, they only have one eye with it, and that is one, and that's a very rare disease. So diabetic retinopathy is a little different uh, bottle, you know, a kettle of fish, because we really, that's a very big public health problem. So we don't know all the, uh, we know that there's some upregulation of VEGF, but some of the others, TGF beta might be upregulated, but some of the other things are probably not, but the, but it is a hypoxia induced problem. So there is potential for that to be, um, to be an important, important role. And diabetic retinopathy is one of the leading causes of blindness. And the other one is age-related macrogeneration, which also right. needs VEGF treatment, also need vascularization. So there's, there's some interesting things to explore for sure. That's what I. That's what I was hoping. What, one one of the question for thirty five years. I, maybe I'm wrong here. Uh, I've used the term hemangioma I in know. describing the lesions yeah. in the brain. That other people, it's gotten kind of trendy to use the term hemangioblastoma. Do you have a sense about that? I actually, I just like retinal angioma. That's nice and simple. Angiomas, yeah. Right. That's what I would like, but but you know I've been I I have been corrected by our by our our pathologists our our ocular pathologists who said it's really hemangial you know blastoma okay so so we've used that sort of formally but when I talk to patients I say it's an angioma I call it the simplest for 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 patients to understand. 
I still use that word, although I think in my writing, I, I use the, so I wouldn't get slapped on the wrist by my, by my pathology friends. Okay. Thank you. I think we, we have time for another uh, quick question. I acknowledge we're running late, but uh, go ahead, Jess. Hi, Dr. Chu. I was just wondering um, if you had any new studies coming down the pipeline, because you had kind of mentioned some things for the future. Are you currently working on anything? Well, we haven't yet. I would love to uh, do it, do an ESC initiated project to look at how we actually give belsudafan for the eyes and, and how long would it last and, and what would you do? So, for example, I talked about the fact you might, you know, these large lesions, you might be able to treat it and then if there's nothing else going on. You can stop the drug, laser it and see what happens. You're not on the drug all the time. And we don't know how long you have to be on the drug for the for the optic nerve tumors. Is that forever? Is there a period of time when you can actually reduce it enough that, that you don't have to go on? So those are really interesting questions that we haven't addressed and, and would be important to address. I would love to be able to do something like that. Thank you. Yeah, I would uh, hope that you would do a, you know, international study as well. And yeah, I would that would be great if we can. That, that certainly that'd be our hope that we can, we can get as many people in. And that's what we do international studies that really help to bring the numbers up and also brings diversity and be able to be generalizable to other populations other than the U.S. population. Great. Thank you. I am told that we have a little bit more time. So if there are any other questions. Um, I think there are some questions in the Q&A that I can read out if, if you'd like. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Um, from Franco Pradelli, we have very interesting Dr. Chu. I've been reading your papers for my work and it's great to hear you present your results live. Um, my question, do you have any OCT and geography image showing the effect of belzutifan on retinal hemangioblastoma? We we have some we have actually we actually have fluorescing we actually did fluorescence the, the injection because that really shows the leakage or the OCTA is is um, we have some of those as well but some of them are hard to capture because they're far out in the periphery so we cannot capture them with our with our instrumentation but when the optic nerve ones we do have a few with that um, so we do have some standardized OCTA and that would be a really interesting study to look at as well. Because as you know, the OCTA is, is non-invasive. We don't have to inject any dyes and we can just use it to look at blood vessel flow, uh, red blood cell flows within the blood vessels and we can capture them in different planes. And it's, it's like looking at the volume of the retina. So that's a really, uh, it's a very good question. We definitely would have some of those and I didn't show any of those, but definitely for sure we can actually look at that in our, in our, in our future studies. Um, there's one more question if there's time. I think we do have a bit more time, Jordan. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the major issues with eye tumors is edema. When you shrink the tumor, does the edema leave any lasting damage to the eye or is the eye tissue normal following reduction of the edema? That's a very good question. So I showed you the OCT uh, and, and how it, it was really elevated. And, and you can see that the, the normal one is quite thin. And the and retina does not like to have fluid around. And if it's around for a long time, it can cause some damage. And the hard exudates, though those those fatty deposits also are damaging to the photoreceptors, the cells that we see with. So the the problem with having fluid, uh, if it has damage, it doesn't get down periodically, you're going to have permanent damage. So that's the reason why people may have very large tumor or small tumors in the periphery, but they cause uh, hemorrhage and things in the, in the center or heart exudates or fluid in the center, that could be, a, that could be damaging. Uh, and, and that is the reason why it's important to be vigilant and look for things that you can treat in the periphery before it gets too out of hand. And, but now with Belsudafan, we, we think we can really turn these things around. And, and it really shrinks, it, it gets the fluid down. And that's, you know, the sooner you, the better you are, the longer period you are without fluid, the better you are for your vision. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for that wonderful talk.